Hello, everyone. I'm Denton Davidson for Gold Derby, and I'm joined by Oscar winners Dan Lindsay and TJ Martin, the directing duo behind Tina, a documentary told through the lens of its subject, Tina Turner on HBO Max. It had over a million viewers its first week. It was the highest rated doc of the year for them. How happy does that make you guys? And what does that say about the pull an 81-year-old Tina Turner still has? <laughs> oh, that's, that question is definitely a first. Um, I, look, I mean, I, I think you, you, you make a film with the intent because well, cause something speaks to you and then you make a film with the intent of hopefully sharing that same little kernel of something with an audience. So the numbers are, are you know, they're, it's awesome to hear in terms of, you know, kind of breaking milestones. But for the most part, I think it's the most rewarding thing is just knowing that people are finding resonance with, with, with the film and, and Tina's story. So yeah, it, feel, it feels great in that regard. And to your point, I think there's, you know, Tina Turner is doing a lot of heavy lifting in that, uh, in that equation. Um, and Simon Shin and Jonathan Shin initially contacted you about directing this film. What was your reaction to that? And 10 years ago, were you ever thinking, oh yeah, I'll for sure be directing the definitive documentary of an icon with her involvement? I mean, I can answer the, the last part with a definitive no. Um, we did not think that. Um, we were actually kind of hesitant when Simon and Jonathan asked us to do it. Um, we were, uh, you know, we right from the beginning, we were like, are two men really the right people to tell this story? Um, and we had just, we had been approached to do a lot of, of kind of, for lack of a better term, celebrity focused uh, biopics or documentaries, whatever you want to call them. And uh, that was just never really of interest to us. But, you know, in digging down, I mean, we knew the kind of broad strokes of Tina's story, like a lot of people do. And, you know, we end up kind of getting into that in the film. But, um, but once we dove into it, we realized that there was something that was like actually cinematic and there's a story to be told here. And, and then meeting Tina was the thing that really, uh, and understanding her complicated relationship to her story is what made us convinced that there was a real movie here. And it's right at the beginning of the film, you say interview one, take one. And you ask her about the People Magazine interview, which uh, was where she goes public about the past abuse. Uh, first of all, I love how the film describes how being in People at that time was equivalent to going viral because I think it just puts it in great perspective. Um, but I thought that was also a bold first question. You just really dove in there. What made you decide to go right in that direction? Well, I mean, you know, I, I think after, after spending time with Tina, um, kind of trying to figure out what facet of her story we were going to tell, because you know, Tina's lived kind of an incredible life. It's kind of a one in a billion story. It's a saga of sorts. And, you know, to really do it justice, you need to kind of do like a 10 part series. So really it was trying to identify what, what lane are we going to take and what facet of her story are we going to explore? And so after spending time with her, it was very much um, a revelation, even though in retrospect, it shouldn't have been that she's still processing the pain of her past and the trauma that she, she endured. So um, that was just something we couldn't shake. So when it, and it fundamentally affected our approach for the film. So in trying to, in, 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 in kind of reverse engineering that we started to realize that part of that is this notion, this decisions that she took to go public with her story was also fundamentally the thing that put it out in the world that allowed her to not, to, to, to not be able to escape her own narrative, right? It was something that people fell in love with and kind of took ownership over her narrative. So for us, it was it was very much a, 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 we thought it was a unique lens to look at the Tina Turner stories, the story of Tina, but also the story of the narrative of Tina and her relationship to that story. So what night, why not a better place to start than telling the origin story of the story of Tina? <laughs> right. And so we just kind of leaned in on that. And we were very, um, we were very honest with, with her and transparent in terms of the things that we were interested in. And she just kind of kept opening up to us. Um, and, and maybe because no one had really kind of explored that facet of, of, of her journey. And it's not so much a documentary about her artistry, although you can't not see that if you're watching it. Um, so is that a conflict when you have like a music icon like that 
and also someone that has such an incredible personal story. But I mean, as you said, you could you could probably have a two hour documentary about the making of the private dancer album. Yeah. So um, this, did she sort of give you free reign and make you feel comfortable to take the story in the direction that you wanted to? Yeah, I mean, Tina wasn't really, you know, other than meeting with her and doing the interviews and um, and filming some with her. It's not like she was watching cuts or anything. She saw the movie when it was finished. She gave us complete, you know, we had complete control to make the film that we wanted to make. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, that that was a, a real struggle in making it actually was like, we wanted to, um, you know, there were so many things we wanted to dive in. And to your point, you could make an entire amazing film just about her artistry as a performer and the legacy that she has left on um, music. I think what we ultimately felt though was um, to your point, like you can just watch her perform and I don't need somebody to, in a talking head to tell me she's got an amazing voice or she, you know, like what she does as a performer, like I'm just watching it. And so we made a, a, a conscious choice early on that we, we knew we wanted to have musical moments where we just let the music play out and you watched her perform. And that hopefully by the end of it, you are like, well, I don't need somebody to didactically tell me um, why she's so amazing. I just experienced it for two hours. And the, the People interview came along with audio tapes, which, you know, sort of acted as a guide in some way throughout the film. Did you know that those tapes existed or was that just sort of a gift that, that you received? Because it, it sort of also allowed you to avoid asking those direct questions to her over and over again as well. Yeah, exactly. Dan, do you want to talk about how we- Yeah, I mean, we didn't, we, with Carl? Yeah, we, <laughs> we didn't know that the tapes existed at all. We didn't even know if Carl was still around. He was, uh, we, we actually had to, eventually we found a mailing address for him uh, and sent a handwritten letter asking him <laughs> if he was the Carl Arrington that wrote for People Magazine. And, and thankfully he responded back to us and uh, we were just, reaching out to him to see if we can get an interview and uh he said well you know i have the tapes from that interview still would you be interested in those and we were like yes we would uh previous to that though we had you know one of our first things we did was read i tina and um you know after uh reading that and talking about it a little bit it dawned on us uh, maybe everybody else would have noticed right away but <laughs> it dawned on us like oh this is in a oral history format like there's no way kurt was like right. he had to be recording these interviews with her so we reached out to Kurt and and also you know uh to see if he had those tapes and uh and he did uh, it was a bit of a struggle to get them because they were in different places and all these things but that was the that was kind of the more the beginning of like oh we could use maybe these audio tapes to not have to um at, to not have to drag Tina back through some of that stuff um but also as a texture within the film and then yeah we met Carl and he had those and it was this amazing uh amazing kind of gift to the film yeah i mean the tapes are pretty they're they're a pretty critical component of the film i mean we knew you know we try to make as, as much as possible our work uh immersive and not always kind of like talking in retrospect um and and you know one of the things we really wanted to do that felt um you know, very, very important and necessary for this film is to make sure that we're telling the story of Tina through, distinctly through Tina's POV and distinctly through Tina's voice. So the tapes really allowed um, for us to hear, uh, like there's an immediacy in those moments in time when she's kind of sharing the, um, not just kind of what she endured with her family and with Ike, but also kind of her processing, especially with like the Kurt tapes, processing that transition into into becoming a global superstar and with the Carl tapes processing the transition from leaving Ike and jumping off a cliff and going on a limb and saying I'm going to go be a, a, a solo act so it just it, it there's an immediacy to it that that um, I feel like really kind of elevated the film and was very much in line with making sure that we're preserving the the intent which is to to uh, to learn to to experience the film through Tina's through Tina's voice, you know. Yeah, it's so powerful to have her voice, you know, saying that as opposed to just hearing it third person. Um, what is it like as documentary film workers 
or filmmakers um, when you're relying on other people's footage. Cause you know, there's documentaries where, you know, okay, we're gonna go make a documentary about this and you shoot everything and that's great. But when you have historic figures, um, someone like Tina Turner, how do you even begin to pour through the hours of footage that, I mean, you must've had to go through. You have everything from the Brady Bunch hour to you know, look like home videos. So, I mean, how does, what does that even look like? Oh man. Well, a big credit. Chaos. <laughs> yeah, chaos. And a big credit goes to Ben Piner, too, our co producer, who uh, also co produced LA 92, our last film, which was entirely made of archival material. Um, and he's kind of a, just a, a, a genius, a savant at finding that um, stuff and kind of tracking things down. And, you know, we spend, the three of us spend a lot of time also just kind of trying to imagine almost like detectives, like trying to imagine like, okay, if this person was there, did, would that, you know, and so it's a lot of it is reaching out to people that um, through process of elimination of like who might have stuff. But the pro, I mean, TJ, if you want to speak to the, I mean, just going through the amount of footage is like, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, look, I think every, every, every team and every filmmaker is different, I, but I would imagine like many, we, you know, we have to start with story first, right? So like to, to Dan's earlier point, one of the reasons we don't, we don't really engage in kind of celebrity driven material is they're trying to leverage the celebrity first or in Tina's case, the pot, the interest in maybe a catalog first versus servicing, finding something that is actually storytelling. And so it's just, you know, in, in the similar vein that there's not like, um, we're not, we're not uh, exploring and highlighting every single hit she had. You, we're not looking at catalog first, we're looking at story force and then story is gonna drive, um, you know, what, what archive is gonna be able to, to, to support the actual journey that we're trying to explore, you know, but to keep it all, to make it kind of feel alive, um, I think it's a healthy balance of not being super didactic with what the visuals are to support the story, but also kind of taking days and, and just finding footage that you that Ben found or that you kind of stumbled upon or on YouTube or you just kind of discovered. And, and, and honestly, a lot of it's play, play with it a little bit and try to find an identity for the film and try to catch a, we always say try to catch a vibe, you know, but it, <laughs> but it is like, don't, you know, I think, I think there's still a, we still live in a world where the association with documentary filmmaking is that it's an extension of journalism, which there are, which is partially true, but, you know, we, we tend to want to make something that leans more cinematic. And sometimes that just requires you to kind of uh, play with the footage and find a new identity for it that goes beyond like just a delivery tool for information. You know, how do you actually evoke emotion with it? And that's just, that's time and playing with the material. And she put her story out publicly so people would stop talking about it. And of course it had the opposite effect. Here we are today still talking about it. Um, do you get the sense, um, cause I was never quite sure, but do you get the sense that she's sort of come to terms with the fact that she's not only a music icon but she's sort of an icon of what it means to be a survivor? I think, I mean, from spending time with her, I would say that she has gained a better understanding of that since she retired. Um, I don't really think she fully grasped what she meant um, and why she meant what she meant to the public while she was um, still touring and performing. Um, for her, you know, Tina is unique as a performer in many ways in that she is exactly that, a performer. Like she is not coming to this as a means necessarily. I mean, I, there are aspects of it that are self-expression obviously, but she is not an artist of like, I need to say this or I need to, you know, she is a performer. And, um, and so I don't think, and she thinks of that as her work. And so when she retired, she like retired. And I think that maybe gave her the opportunity to look back, but she's not, yeah, again, she's not like somebody who's drawn in by the adulation. She's not going to like read stuff about herself <laughs> to like understand what the public thinks of her. Um, and I do think over the course of making the film, I mean, there was a difference in the Tina that we sat down with um, in November, 2018, uh, just at her house, just to meet her the first time. Um, 
and the one that we kind of ultimately were filming with on her way to the Broadway premiere. And I do think the experience of the film and the musical gave her, um, I don't, I don't, I'm never going to say it's like closure, but I think it gave her a sense of, um, of acceptance that this is part of her legacy and that, and as she says in the film, I lived an abusive life and like, that's the truth. That's the story. And I can't walk away from that. So um, I, I, it's long winded, but I will also say that I still think she is in the process of understanding and discovering that. And even this film, I think in the way it's come out and the reaction to it has been part of that process for her. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, what, I mean, what it's, you know, I, I, you, you, you asked an interesting question, you know, cause this is something that we, we talked a lot about, like here we are uh, starting to really understand some of uh, the tension in Tina's life in terms of the public having perceiving her in one light and being obsessed with a fast one facet of her story, but not seeing her as a fully three dimensional person. Um, and yet here we are making a film that will potentially continue on that legacy with, you know, that lineage of how we decide to, to impose our own ideas on her. But, you know, uh, I would, I would like to think that by taking the approach we took, it might bring her some solace that this, this piece of work is an opportunity for her that says this is the most accurate reflection of how I see my participation in the persona of Tina. Thus, I don't have to do press and I can bow out. <laughs> That's why you're talking to us right now and not Tina Turner, right? Um, I, and so, so, you know, who knows? I mean, maybe there's, there's deep comfort for her and this is speculation that um, with this this film out there, um, that she doesn't feel the need to 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 set the record straight or re reset the narrative for 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 people. And she gets candid with you, and it's not only serious. There was one particular moment that I thought was funny. Um, she talked about her husband Irwin before they were even dating, and she said she told him that when he got to LA, she wanted him to make love to her. And I thought there's no way they saw that coming out of her mouth. What was surprising to you about her and and just the way that she was and her ability to share stories with you? I mean, that is definitely one that, I mean, I was doing the interview and uh, yeah, I was, and she even prefaced, it's not in the film, I don't think, but she even prefaced it and she said, oh, I have to tell you this. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it was, interviewing Tina was, was, uh, it was definitely an experience. Like she's, she is a major star. She has been interviewed a million times. So she has her like script that she goes into. And we had to try to like constantly be like, no, we don't want the script. Like how do you, at, you know, nearing 80 years old, sitting here talking to me right now, how do you reflect on that thing? Um, and, you know, that was challenging. Um, but it, it did lead to, I think over the course of the time that we we're doing the interview, it did lead to her, I think kind of understanding like, oh, this isn't like, I, I think walking into it, honestly, at the beginning, she probably thought this was like a VH1 special or something. <laughs> and it was just like, okay, here I am. And, um, and so partly also why we asked some of those questions right at the top was to kind of let her know that we're not doing the like greatest hits thing. So, um, so it was a process, um, but there is, yeah. I mean, you know, there was some great things very kind of intimate, vulnerable things too that, that didn't make the film um, from that interview as well. Um, yeah. When you have so much footage and you have to make so many cuts, is that is that painful to decide, you know, this has to go? Is that something that ends up on a Blu-ray later? Or are you like, you know what, no, this is the film and this is what we're going with. It, it, it's always painful to have to kind of, you know, as they say, kill your babies, which is a, such a terrible expression. But to divorce <laughs> yourself from you know scenes and stuff that you that uh, that you, you really love and and I mean there's a there's a to Dan's kind of to Dan's earlier point like there's there was a lot of material um, you know I think we probably had about seven hours of just Tina interview with Tina at at at, at this chapter in her life and then you throw on top of that hours and hours and hours of uh, 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 Kurt Loder tapes and Carl Arrington tapes. And then on top of that, you throw in another 
what, I don't know, over 1500 hours of archive, right? Including, not just including performances, but just maybe some moments behind the scenes uh, that were captured and rare and unique. And, and uh, you know, you fall in love with certain stuff and it's just always kind of somewhat painful to remind yourself as, as we always say, like the sum is bigger than the parts. You know, the hope, the hope is, is if we can be more, actually more specific with the storytelling, it will, it'll tickle your brain and your own imagination to, to, um, to, to, to kind of um, project the kind of the fullness of her life and the full experience that, that she had. Because, you know, as, as you mentioned yourself, like it would, we, we said it would take like 10 part series to do it fully, 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 fully justice. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very much about sticking to your kind of intention and sticking to your, to your thesis. And it's always sums bigger than the parts. And one of the people you interviewed was Rhonda Graham, and she was one of Tina's closest friends that was really there through everything and was one of the few people that could probably give, you know, another perspective of what was going on. Um, did she have her own, and she sadly passed away this year, so I just want to uh, mention that, but did she come with her own archive of information or photos or, or what? Oh man. Yeah. I mean, when we talked earlier about, you know, highlighting Ben finding stuff, we also have to say, I mean, this film wouldn't exist without Rhonda. Um, she, uh, she was very, she was ill already while, when we were starting the film uh, and she had just finished chemo and, and had gotten somewhat better by the time we did her interview. But then shortly after that, the, she went into uh, her, her, her cancer came back and um but Rhonda <laughs> we you know we had heard that she had before we met her we had heard like oh that's the person you need to talk to like uh and we had heard that she was a bit of an amateur photographer and and so we started an email correspondence with her because she was again she was sick right when we started but then she felt better enough that we TJ and I went to her house and uh we were talking about the process and trying to tell her you know our our take on Tina's story and what we wanted the film to be just to because she's very cautious to talk to anybody anyways because she's done a million interviews and is protective of Tina but anyway she said uh, we you know said oh we we heard you might have some photos and she's like well I wouldn't get your hopes up I've got some stuff and we were like okay uh, and she and so then I think after the conversation she had vetted us enough that she goes okay I, I like these guys and she goes let me go grab one of my albums and she comes over and brings an album that has on the side 1964 and she opens it up and it is all just Ike and Tina days touring house photos everything that's not and then she goes I have an album for every year from them so like 65 66 67 68 and we, we came up with this process of being able to scan those things because she's never really, I mean, in, they used it a little bit for reference in What's Love Got to Do With It um, for costuming and stuff, but nobody's ever seen these photos before. Um, and then on top of it, she was like, well, I might have some Super 8 material. Uh, and that was like way into the process of editing. <laughs> and she just revealed this and we're like, oh, you've been holding on to stuff. <laughs> and she was kind of continually, and I happened to live by her. So I got to, I would go over and see her. Um, and we, you know, we grew, uh, we developed a kind of friendship and um, yeah, it was really, really sad um, to hear of her passing. But, um, you know, I, 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 we were very happy. We were able to highlight, you know, what we were that she, you know, in the film that she had given us. And, um, but there's, there's a ton, it's just touching the surface of the stuff that she had. Um, well, Dan and TJ, I could, I could go on and on, but we got, we got to wrap it up. <laughs> um, and I just want to congratulate both of you on the success of Tina. Best of luck with everything going forward. Um, I want to encourage our viewers to subscribe at Gold Derby for more chats with award contenders like these two here. Um, and head over to goldderby.com to make your awards predictions and get all the latest news on upcoming awards season and contenders. Thank you both so much for chatting with me today. I appreciate it. Cool. Thank Thanks you so much. Really appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank you.